This is Reality Dispatch, written by Jim Mintz. It won't hurt, but you will feel some pressure, said the doctor. Josh was 56 and had never broken a bone, suffered a cold, or had a fever. Today, he was being informed he would need to have a series of spinal injections to address a blood anomaly that could be fatal if left unchecked. He thanked the doctor nonchalantly, but refused to shake his hand. He didn't shake the hand of anyone who wasn't born in this country. That was his mantra. He gave a similar vacant acknowledgement of the bill as he paid it on his AMEX to the woman who had prepared his settlement. She was worthy of his time so much that she would be initiating the next appointment. Beyond that, he had no pleasantries for her. He retrieved his vehicle from the underground car park and drove it at top speed on the up ramps towards the exit, almost barreling down a woman and child who had emerged from the preschool located on the level above the medical center. She didn't yell out in a rage like his wife would. They never would, Josh said to himself. He laughed as he passed them. The procedure was in two weeks, which left him 14 days to get as completely shit-faced as his liver would allow. His next stop would be the drive through bottle shop to load up the back of his truck. His tools and pipes were cleared weeks ago since he had been unable to work. His injury insurance allowed for a life of leisure. If that, too, was to be cut down due to his health, he was to make the most of his limited time off by indulging in exactly the kind of activities he would have been doing, only amplified. He placed the last of the six-pack on top of the right others and secured the load tight with the clips that were otherwise reserved for ladders and his toolbox. He contemplated opening a can now for the rest of the drive home, but thought better of it when the cashier gave him a suspicious look. Another foreigner. They're everywhere he thought. The can clicked with ease and he rested it in his lap as he drank the cool beer in his left hand while his right elbow hung out the window, directing the wind up into the car, blowing his hair back and cooling his face. He sang to the song that blasted loud through his popped speakers. They crackled on the low G notes and the rip must have been getting wider for the song was crackling on the high notes just as much. This was even after he had boosted the treble and removed as much of the low end as his stereo could allow. Lousy 20-year-old air-conditioned less truck. Another import. That would be right. Lousy foreigners. Stealing our jobs. Selling us shit cars. Sirens blared on the country road that cut through Tom Petty's vocals. Josh checked the rear view and dropped the can instinctively. He watched as it rolled under the driver's seat, spilling the liquid and leaving a trail like a snail. He looked up and swerved as he observed the truck headed off the road toward a lone telegraph pole. The sirens grew louder as the vehicle approached. Josh cut the feed of the radio and began to slow. He pulled over to the left of the road on the gravel and turned the engine off. He sat looking in the rear view, watching as the officer took his time marking down the vehicle's registration. Josh looked to the floor to see the evidence of the beverage splattered in a radius that stretched over the mat and had dripped over the pedals. He rubbed his foot against the accelerator. It was squeaky. He took a breath in through his nose to discern how noticeable the smell of the beer was. He was startled as the officer arrived at the opened window. He was instantly disgusted to see he was, as Josh believed, a foreigner. Do you know the speed limit on these roads? The officer asked in a tone Josh took to be overly assertive, abusive of his power, arrogant. He shook his head. Can I see your license, please? Josh reached into his pocket to retrieve his wallet and removed the license from the inside sleeve. He held it over to the officer who took it and walked off. Be right back, 
he said as he marched away. Josh was surprised he hadn't been breathalyzed yet. On the horizon, a puff of dust was radiating on the heat rays that were dazzling below the sky and above the Earth's surface. The dust grew larger, which meant the car was traveling at speed. You numb nuts, Josh said as he watched it approach his truck. He assumed his truck was blocking the police car from view. Otherwise, there would be a dramatic slowdown. No luck. The car continued at high velocity. By now, it would have been aware of the police presence on the side of the road, and it didn't matter. What it was running from or towards was enough that the driver was willing to risk life and liberty. Josh wondered if the driver was hitting speeds of 150 kilometers an hour, possibly more. As it passed, the wind velocity was so strong that the truck rattled back and forth on its axis. Josh heard the jogging legs of the policemen who had pulled him over, reached the window of the driver's side, and threw the license back into the vehicle with the flick of a wrist. It's your lucky day, he yelled, as he turned back to his own vehicle, got behind the wheel, U-turned, and began the fruitless chase for the car so far gone that it was a ghost. Yes, it is, Josh said to himself, unlatching another can of beer before reigniting his engine and continuing his journey home for two weeks of solid drinking. At the corner of Hickson and Montgomery Streets is a pub. The locals call it the Monty. Josh drank there five nights a week. He enjoyed having a punt on whatever was on offer. The dogs, the trots, the horse races. Tonight, there was a UFC fight. He didn't know the fighters. He didn't know the rules. He only knew that he didn't want to throw money at the guy who appeared of mixed blood. There might be some advantage granted to his heritage. Josh was interested in fighters of pure blood and pure origin. The opponent had the same skin pigmentation as Josh, and this was enough for him to throw 300 of the insurance compensation dollars on him to bring home the trophy. Josh would stay later than usual to see the outcome and debate amongst his drinking buddies the merits of betting on your kind. A fruitless speech he had given, for the one he had placed his financial trust in, was beaten to a pulp. The battle would go down as one of the legendary beatdowns of the newly formed sport as it evolved in its infancy. Josh spat at the communal television screen and was escorted from the premises. He shoved at the hired security for touching him in the process, complaining about the loss of the previous security guard, Barnes, whom Josh could always count on to treat him with a sense of dignity and decency. Not like this foreign animal. On the morning of the surgery, Josh was sat down by the physician in a waiting room where he had the opportunity to ask questions. Josh had none. He was withdrawing from alcohol addiction, as per instruction from his wife. He had missed the last scheduled surgery. Although he was physically in attendance, the overly high levels in his bloodstream rendered the procedure too dangerous to continue. Remarkably high level floating through his bloodstream, the surgeon commented on the transfer sheet. The doctor suggested he make the next appointment. Otherwise, he would be charged for each session missed thereafter, not to mention the jeopardy on his health and his consistent evasion. Josh had his last sip of whiskey at 11.59 the night before. He was to be clean for 20 hours. He was now 34 hours sober, and he was angry. You may not have any questions, but I am obligated to tell you of some of the side effects patients have experienced after having this procedure. The iodized metallic concentration is made from a radiated material that can affect the sensitivity of your iris. What this means is that for 24 to 48 hours after completion, you may be temporarily blind before the atoms and particles are relayed through your pupils once more. Then, after which, you will see the world a little differently, said the doctor. How different? Cheryl, 
Josh's wife asked. She was sitting on his left, stroking his hand. It's hard to say. Different people report different experiences. Some say people and objects appear more translucent. It's very hard to describe. The main thing you need to know is that you will continue to lead a normal life and the threat of premature death is removed by much as 80%. The surgeons took turns getting the needle into the crevices of his spinal cord. Josh was oblivious, being unconscious for the duration of the procedure. A week had passed and he was at home, unable to watch the TV, unable to use the bathroom without an escort, unwilling to sleep due to the constant exposure to the darkness. He was a pain to Cheryl, who begged him to stop drinking. Your symptoms will ease, she'd plead. They won't, he'd yell back. I'm blind forever. She resorted to hiding his drinks, and after three days of complaining, he accepted that he would not be able to touch a drop until something emerged in his field of view. At four o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon in September, light fragments began to show as he went for a walk with his cane, Bulldog Bill, and Cheryl, who held his left arm when they needed to cross the street. He stopped in the middle of the footpath and declared his ability to make out light sources, much to the amazement of Cheryl, who erupted into applause and laughter. Fueled by a relief, that she would no longer have to slave over his consistent demands. The days progressed his development, and soon after, as the month ended and the seasons cooled, Josh could see again, people, shapes, but not colors, not objects as he remembered. People were different. He could make them out, but not as he saw them before. Instead, they were translucent and identical. Everyone appeared as if their skin no longer covered their organs. All he could see when he looked out amongst people in the world was their hearts beating, different shapes, sizes, and rapidity of heartbeats. The young ones beat at a fast rate, whilst he could tell those who were elderly due to the slow pace. Looking down at his own hands and feet, he too was translucent, with only the veins underneath his skin showing out to the world. When he craned his neck down further, he could see the outline of his heartbeat pulsating one beat at a time. Everyone was the same, and he could not tell anyone apart. But he was alive. So was everyone else, so he could see. The shades that had formed a barrier to his perceptions of the world were removed. He now had a metaphysical perspective. He could see his heart and the heart of all others. Since he could see his weakness and vulnerability to the world, he no longer desired to poison himself and watch his heart grow weaker. He no longer drank. His lack of sight gave him a perfect vision, changing his worldview and allowing him to understand alternatives. I don't know what I'm supposed to do now that things are different, Cheryl, he said to her one morning. They walked hand in hand, Things aren't different, she said, but they look different, but they aren't. For more stories of fact-based fiction, head to jimmins.substack.com.